Good morning and welcome to another music cafe. The coffee cup is full, so we're ready to go today. And uh, one of the great joys in, uh, in doing this and working with fantastic musicians is that every once in a while you get really, really blown away. And that is the case today. Uh, I'm, I'm so delighted to have with me uh, Michael Christie, who's the music director. Good morning. Current. I've got my Good coffee morning. cup ready. Good, mor <laughs> Good morning, Michael. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Uh, currently, um, music director with the New West Symphony, but your your CV is so impressive. I was reading it uh, as I told you yesterday, and and, and this morning going it uh, over it again. At, you're you're a little younger than me, and, and it's so impressive that you were uh, music director with Queensland. I guess after you came another conductor there, and now Alondra de la Parra took took over that orchestra. You're very familiar with Australia, been in Perth. Also, um, I suppose with some opera there. Uh, all over the US, I'm just gonna read it quickly, and Canada too, you went, uh, you conducted the opera in Montreal, the Brooklyn Symphony, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Rotterdam Philharmonic, which I love, uh, Yannick uh, mm. used to be there. The National Symphony, where Gian Andrea Noceda is a conductor now, uh, Rochester, Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Cincinnati, Lille, the, the symphony in Lille, um, the Swedish and Netherlands radio symphonies, uh, Tasmania, Perth, and we will get to others. Um, how did you get into music, Michael? Good morning. I uh, had this really amazing experience growing up. I was the eldest of four children, and my parents were... Um, they were, they were so generous about trying to make sure that we stayed together as a family group, but also had individual time with them. So we would have these outings individually with my parents, each child. And one of the things that my parents took me to was the Buffalo Philharmonic in Buffalo, New York, near where you are. And it was clear that that was, would be a good experience for me as a, a young trumpet player at the time, but also for my, my um, siblings as well. So we started going more frequently to Buffalo Philharmonic. And then I decided I just wanted to meet the conductors. And so I went up to the stage door and said, I want to meet Max Valdez. I want to meet AGOA. I want to meet these these people. And uh, that that progressed. I and ended up studying with, with both of those gentlemen. Uh, but there was there were just some really funny coincidences like um, the the Buffalo Bills. The, the football team was on a really great streak at that time. They were that 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 was the time when they were winning the or they were they didn't win sadly <laughs> when they got they the don't four win very often <laughs> no when they were in the um, the four Super Bowls it was during this time and the Buffalo Philharmonic would, would be playing during some of these uh, regular season games so we would buy the very cheapest student seats at the at the back of the auditorium and run to the front and. Uh, and so it was great to be able to see the orchestra up close. And I, it really got me thinking about uh, the, a variety of music that happens in a concert hall. But also I was very struck by how the musicians interacted with the audience and how the conductors did or did not. And that, was, that became very formative for my future thinking about the business. It, it's very, very unusual for a trumpet player to become a conductor. Uh, usually... Right. It's piano, uh, violinist. I've, I think I've only seen one other trump trumpet player who became a conductor, and right now he's executive director of the orchestra in Sao Paulo. Uh, oh. why, why conduct? What, what attracted you to conduct? Well, there were definitely, there, there was, it was really for me a, a question of how does that work? So I remember in middle school asking my middle school band director, how is it that we all play together when you give us that beat? And he actually allowed me to get in front of my my seventh and eighth year colleagues and and try this conducting thing. And it was so it was so interesting that we as performers give ourselves to the impetus of someone standing in front. And it wasn't it. For some reason, I wouldn't say it was one of those things where I was thinking, oh, I must conduct, I must lead the music. But I was more, I was more enchanted by just the whole, the whole process that we, that we came together. And then I, I just had this very, very generous people um, 
in conducting positions who would say, oh, well, just give this a try and see what you think. And um, that that's really how I, I got started. It was one of those things where I, I think I just became more fluent with the language and then became more interested in the scope of the job because being a being the musical catalyst is a f- small fraction of what we at, at least in North America especially have to have to do as as conductors so i became really i became really in- fascinated and and i think enchanted by the scope of it all i like doing the planning i like doing the the thinking with the organization about how we go forward. I like commissioning new music. I like interfacing with the composers and the musicians. And there's just something very um, chief operating officer that I really, really enjoy very much. It, 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 it's very interesting because that's not also the job of the conductor, but the music director and some orchestras, the artistic director, with the planning is really not up to the conductor unless you're the... And it's exactly what you're doing with the, with Natalia in, uh, at New West, planning uh, what you're doing next. And I, I guess with COVID right now, it has become even more important, the, the programming. What are you going to show in a time that you don't have people in the concert hall and you have, you know, very limited time with your audience? How, how is that working these days uh, for you with uh, New West? Well, I... Th- I have had to acknowledge that people's appetite for different kinds of experiences on their computer is much shorter. And so uh, where, whereas we usually think about concerts of an hour and 45 minutes to two hours for symphony, not to mention opera, um, we really have to take our performances and presentations online and make them very bite size in a certain sense. So I've definitely become much more, I've reacquainted myself with a whole corner of the repertory that um, I knew very well in previous lives doing other chamber orchestra activity. Um, but because we have those, that sense of the audience's time, um, cap- uh, their, their desire to, to, to stick with that particular thought, um, plus just having to, convene much smaller ensembles in order to produce the presentations. All of that has come together in a, and I think a very different um, way of thinking about programming. We have decided at New West to make it much more culture focused. And so we have identified uh, a cultural mini festival format, which allows me to um, look at the standard repertory and say, well, what are the influences into the music of Debussy, the music of Philip Glass, the um, composers of the Holocaust era, and then take this incredible online platform and fill in the gaps, the make these basically these visual program notes that we I think we all wish we could do in the concert hall, right. but we there's there's simply not time to give all that depth. That's what this the the beauty of being online has been. Uh, to to give that depth, and that's what we're trying very hard to do. I'm going to show uh, 30 seconds because otherwise we get the copyright police after us. But I'm going to show 30 <laughs> seconds of uh, something you did a couple of weeks ago with the New West Symphony. <laughs> Under 30 seconds. So there you go. Right. Philip Glass evening song. Um, it, it's it's one of those things that you would never see an opera by uh, by Philip Glass and uh, you know, American composers. Uh, and and Philip Glass is over repetitive, but it's 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 really lovely. And I want to thank you because I learned about this composition because of you uh, playing it. it. It's really amazing, and I think that it would be hard to bring you know, the, the audience to see this kind of uh, work without doing it online and in the format that you envision doing it. Yeah, well, the, the, the context that we, this, so this was part of our tour of India, and that was a fantastic program because there's so much 
influence on Western composers over centuries from the Indian subcontinent. And what I wanted to demonstrate with, with Satyagraha was not only the impact of Sanskrit on, um, on the languages facing East into Asia, but also the, the sense of the cycle of rhythm and of, of musical time that happens in Indian music is really reflected in Philip Glass's sensibility. We don't think about it necessarily, and I'm not sure that he would say, I'm trying to have a, uh, that, that, um, that cycle of, of the Raga, for example, but it's, but somehow it's in, it's in the DNA of it. And so I thought it was a great way to, um, help draw the connection about how our cultures keep impacting each other and influencing. Philip Glass composes, uh, you know, very international music. Yeah, he's, he's probably one of the most successful American composers, but he did this with India. He did the uh, uh, Amazonia, uh, not it was Amazonia, uh, about Brazil, the seven, the seven rivers in Brazil, which is uh, really fantastic. Um, is it hard to bring audiences to appreciate and love this music, which is really fantastic. It's, it's just hard to program it, you know, or it was hard to program it before COVID. I think, I think it's just all about context. And the more I've been thinking about being online, the more I remember how, how important it was and how much emphasis we put on reading program notes for the audience. And if they didn't read those program notes before our, our live concerts, they were completely lost about what the inspiration was. And I think that is actually one of our great opportunities going forward is how we thread together the pieces on our program. So I do think in a certain way that we faced a bit of a challenge, more of a challenge with um, incorporating works that weren't just Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, that, that, that was more than just saying, here's your diet of new music, take it. I really think that we, I, I feel that we have learned a lot during this time about how we can communicate to our patrons more, um, just more wholly about what the, what, what the, the inspiration is. So um, we certainly at New West before COVID, we were already starting on that pathway. We, we actually created an entire line of programming during our intermission so that we could give our audience, if they chose, rather than going to the bathroom line or the the line for the for the drinks and and um, nibbles, um, that they could ha they could observe a an, a Q and A with our guest artists during the intermission. They could hear a piece of new music during the intermission. They could come and go freely. Um, so we had already been thinking about that a lot. But so when we made the leap to being online, it wasn't that it wasn't that hard, but. <clears throat> it's really been a great opportunity. You've worked with uh, huge orchestras, with medium orchestras, with small orchestras, and you've done like really incredible things at this time with, with New West. But the bigger orchestras have not been able to adapt nearly of what you're doing. Why is that? They have the budget. Well, they it, have the, it's definitely the artistics, <laughs> the content there. I, I would have to really sit down with my colleagues and ask them about the conversations they're having internally. Um, yes, their, their musicians are on the payroll to a certain extent still. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I hear conversations, people saying that they don't want to devalue what they're doing by doing certain things online. And I'm, and I don't, I'm not saying that an orchestra is saying that specifically, mm -hmm. <clears throat> But it seems that it seems that there, the 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 question marks about what people get out of the online experience are kind of haunting us to a certain extent. So I think you're either bravely going where few orchestras have gone before, um, or or maybe just saying I need to pool my cash and wait till we go back online or go back go back into the hall. I, I have to believe that virtually no industry will be untouched by this circumstance. <clears throat> so I guess we've taken the standpoint, uh, the, the viewpoint of saying, let's learn as much as we can while we have to, and then be ready when we come back into the hall to be able to reach out to that 
third or quarter of the audience that can't or won't be able to come back. And I actually feel really um, more comfortable now in this medium that we'll be able to present something more um, uh, more relevant to people that can't come back in, in a way that they understand uh, and have an easier time when, when we do come back. So for the big orchestras, I, I really just say, you know, come on, in, jump on in, the water's fine. Um, it's, it's not easy to do material online, um, but the, the distancing guidelines, all everything is so clear now about what we can and can't do. And the repertory is, is vast. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I think the publishers are being very, um, creative, uh, Philip Glass's publishers were fantastic about allowing us to do a, the, a version that worked for the COVID ensemble that we had, we'll call it the COVIDized orchestra. Um, and other, other composers and performers, guest artists are, we, we all understand what, what's going on. So yeah, I would say get out there and <laughs> create great content because you, you won't monetize it hugely, but it's, but it'll be in front of your public and you can really exercise your artistic muscle. I, I, I think that the monetization will, will adapt as we yeah. adapt to the new reality. I, I find it very complicated to go back to the concert hall, especially in the opera environment where you have, you know, 2,500 to 3,500 seats. It, it will be very complicated. We will get there, yes, but it's going to take a long time. The audience. Well, I also um, think I also think that people, when they watch an ensemble soloist orchestra online, they see how um, how enlightening it is to to get those close ups and to the different the the art of the videograph of the of the camera person, the art of the sound designer. It's a whole nother group of people that should be in our world as part of our team. And the, the artistry of that is is part of the experience. And I, I, I do think that there's going to be a group of people that normally sit in row W that say, gosh, if I was at home, I could see that violin this close. Yeah. And I like that. And I think yeah, we have to be ready for that. It's very interesting to see, you know, the, the real close ups. And I always compared when I started working classical music that you have to do um, the show like a, like a rock concert. The big screens are mm -hmm. there to show you the nuances of what's going on on stage, especially in classical music when you have a great pianist and you can't see the hands. You see it you know, from 200 meters away. It's, it's really far. Yeah. And it, it brings a new perspective of what it is. I saw on, on YouTube the other day a video of Yuja Wang playing at a speed that the camera cannot uh, you know, record it. She's going so fast. And it's incredible to have the camera right there on the keyboard so yeah well there was so much debate about having cameras and screens in the hall that was happening over the last decade and different orchestras and opera companies tried different things i i'd like to think that this experience has broken down that sense of purity that we can't have we can't possibly have that visual interference with my experience 200 feet away <laughs> um exactly. so and and also we had we had an event online the other night and we had this terrific pianist Kevin Cole and so we had the camera was looking straight down his keys and one of the people wrote into the chat well if i get a view like this i don't need to worry about sitting on the keyboard side of the hall and i just thought well yes that's exactly the point that we're that there will be a group of people that are going to want to be in that hall fighting for those keyboard seats and there's going to be a group of people that sit at home with their with that camera looking straight down that keyboard who want it, who want the experience that way too and i really think it's so important that we're ready for both of those scenarios absolutely uh michael i want to ask you about uh, a couple of interesting things i in my opinion it, it's it's the beauty again of not knowing a lot um you were assistant conductor in zurich with uh, right. Franz Wessler most. Mm -hmm. How did that affect your life working at Zurich? You know, that they're famously, you know, have these fantastic conductors like Franz, like um, uh, Fabio Luisi, 
uh, John Andrea Nocera will. How did that come along? Because you started with the uh, symphonic and then moved to opera. How did that affect your professional career and, and you as a person, your development in general? Well, I, th I think having experience in an opera pit is something you can't, you can describe it, but you can't, you can't really convey the exact feeling unless you're there. And what it is, is this, this feeling of tug and pull about who, who's controlling what, when. Because when you're marshalling those forces from the opera pit, you're yielding control to the singers, then back to the soloist and the orchestra. You're 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 trying you're harnessing all of these things. And whereas I think more often with symphony concerts, the focus is more on the conductor, and you're really steering the the boat more more directly. Opera, you're trying to, you're basically this linchpin between the stage and the pit, and you're just it's more malleable. And I think that experience in Zurich, watching uh, dozens and dozens of amazing conductors execute that in different ways was was great because it made me understand the, the individuality of it, but the importance of nurturing people's uh, ability to be flexible when, when making music. Also, Zurich had um, just a startling schedule the the uh, the volume of activities that that opera house does in terms of not only opera performances but their new music ensemble their the chintilla orchestra which 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 tours uh their symphony concerts so as an assistant conductor there and part of the team you just had to always be ready to flex and be 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 ready to move to the next thing and i think that was very helpful uh, when I came back to the U.S. and took on different roles uh, to be able to compartmentalize in my mind what, what needed to happen. But I also really appreciated that they were, the musicians there in the orchestra had a, a, an array of activities that they could do. Obviously, they were engaged to be in the pit, but also they could be part of um, the, when, when Nicholas Arnencourt, for example, would come, there was a group of them that that were that had volunteered effectively to learn the early uh, historical performance instruments. So there was a group of people that that had self-selected to do that. There was a group of people that self-selected to um, to do the new music. Um, so I, I I brought that back to the U.S. to to a certain extent, and I hope very much at at some point um, while I'm still <laughs> doing all of this to do to work with an orchestra to create. Um, in a professional development sense, a group of people that are highly um, trained to be the education ensemble, the new music ensemble, the early music ensemble, um, because I think it's just it's it's a great way for people to flex their their musical muscles. So I, I learned so much in Zurich and so many things I want to still accomplish. I'm 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 going to ask you about your return to the U.S. in a second, but before we return to the uh, to the U.S. I want to ask you about your time in Berlin with the Stadtoper and, and working closely with uh, Daniel Barenboim. Um, he, he's obviously one of the finest pianists that ever lived, um, uh, a fantastic conductor, very close to the Berlin Phil. Obviously, uh, Berlin loves him and keeps him on, uh, as the head of uh, the Stadtoper and uh, at Pierre Boulez's uh, um, center there at the new hall that he created. How was it to work with him? Because he is one of the only personalities that I would be very afraid of meeting. Uh, uh, you know, I admire him tremendously, but I'm terribly, terribly afraid of him. I would say uh, Maestro Barenboim has exacting standards but incredibly gracious. So my time there was w during the uh, production of The Ring Cycle. And what I loved with him is that even when he was working with, with singers who had performed this a hundred times, he was listening so carefully to what they did. And he wasn't just saying, no, you must do it this way, you must do it that way. He would, he would say, he would, he, would, he would really feel almost what mood they were in and then mold the clay a bit. And he would say, yes, this, Doch. Is it doch or is it doch? Doch. It was it was really 
this he you could just feel him tailoring the 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 role to that particular artist and that I really took from him because he was so curious and interested in the vision that he had and how that would be manifest in that artist and he was so he was just so generous with them and and he would offer ideas and you could feel him suggesting he would like to go in this direction but that was that was part of the process but you you definitely had to make sure you knew what was happening because um, if you didn't, he needed to move on to whatever the next activity was. So if you had questions for him, you needed to be specific uh, because there was a line of people behind you waiting to ask their own questions. But he was always generous with everyone that was there. Uh, he would do these incredibly long days, making sure that everybody that was scheduled to do something with him got the time they needed. So amazing, man. Yeah, it's like every time he performed, like my favorite sonatas, are with him and with uh, Stuart Goodyear. But the way he yeah. performs uh, Sonata Number no. 7, he played it in, in Berlin. It's like I watch it over and over again. It, you can never get tired of the perfect... Like, he does it with so precision. Like, there's no room for error there. And, and right. you know, it, 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 it brings fear. I've seen him perform twice live and and it's with, with fear like some sort of reverence which is very odd for me i usually go to enjoy the music and say i'm going to enjoy it but he he's conducting and playing the piano at the same time it's really really hard yeah he um, his brain operates at just a, a different bandwidth <laughs> it's just on another plane amazing and he's been doing it forever you know like right. all his life he's been doing this so uh, i guess you're one of the lucky ones that gets to got to interact with him at uh, that close and doing the rings. I mean, <laughs> how more spectacular yeah. can that get? Uh, right. <laughs> you came back to the U.S. and and uh, started uh, with the opera. You, um, you were the music director at uh, in Minnesota, which uh, finished a couple of years ago. But a couple of years ago, you also won the Grammy for. Um, uh, the reinvent not the re is it the reinvention revolution. The reinvention of uh sorry the revolution of uh Steve Jobs Steve Jobs uh with yeah. with uh, with uh, none other than the Santa Fe uh, opera which is like if there's a dream of building a hall that's it right. that's how you build a a concert hall um, right how was it not to win the 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 Grammy because that's just a result of your work with the with with the organization uh, it's a great result but it, it's it's what comes out but how is it to perform an opera that it's completely unusual and absolutely American well it's one of the the amazing things about immersing yourself in new music is that you do start to get a, a certain sense of responsibility about setting tradition and that and of course when you're working in an opera environment and you have those weeks to um, collaborate with the performing artists with the stage director with the composer and librettist there which is essential you really again as I was saying about my uh, about my experience at the Zurich Opera the that that flexibility about um, connecting the pit in the stage it's the exact same when you're when you're working with new music is you're you're hearing and seeing what the composer is intending through what he or she has written on the page and then you're you're trying to get from them so how much how much slowing down do you mean how much growing louder in dynamic do you mean and really teasing that out and then helping to get all the performers to understand that particular uh, musical language so i think that was the most the, the the most special part about that um, process was through the through the performances through the rehearsal of creating the tradition uh, so to speak or at least beginning the tradition for the piece and um what was really great about um revolution of steve jobs among many things was uh the the way that mason bates the composer was bringing electronics into the pit and into the the fabric of the sound not only to to create um to to give a, a broader palette to the orchestral sound but also the to add and uh, to create the tension in the work to show how um 
the computer technology was overwhelming us in certain ways and then it would fade away and, and we'd be we would see more of the the pl the supple humanity of it so there was a there's a tremendous um underlying plan for how the electronica would work in the in the project and then just seeing everybody making the decisions about someone who was recently alive uh, Steve Jobs, as, as you know, there's three or four movies, feature length movies. There's all these biographies, not to mention all the people that that are still alive and working in the industry that knew him uh, directly and maybe spent decades of their lives. So there was a lot of pressure for us to understand who that man was and what his impact was, not only on the on the technology industry, but on the people around him. So there was a lot of there was a lot of um, excitement there, but a lot of of pulling this lever here and pushing that button there and and just trying to make sure that we were telling the story um, dramatically but also trying to get faithfully to the to who the characters are because it's not like you know some king of England from centuries ago it's this whom we we read a couple of accounts we can see Ashton Kutcher doing this film we can see we can see Steve Jobs on YouTube delivering the Stanford commen commencement address or some of his, we see the person and the way that they, their mannerisms, even their inflection of speech through, through the medium that he helped propagate. We can, we can still be in touch with him. It's, it's remarkable. It must be very complicated to come to the creation of an opera. Um, like uh, probably uh, movie directors go through the same, but, you in particular have to, you have no reference of this opera. Right. I, I, I've been in many, in many rehearsals, I've, as, it, as I remember now, uh, where conductors didn't know, you know, when they have like three different things and say, I don't know how to start this. And they grab their phone and they get the tempo and they say, okay, let's go. That's it. I got it. Uh, you have no reference whatsoever about tempo, about anything. How, how difficult is it to come up with everything for an opera one you have the score and what the uh what the composer intended but you, you really have to put it together for the first time ever yeah absolutely yeah uh, it, yes and and fortunately we do have we can get on the phone actually and call mason bates or kevin puts or one of these conductor uh, composers and say all right so uh your tempo marking is this and if I and I'll sometimes I'll turn my metronome on and say, well, if I'm trying to sing that line, I can't really get the words out. And they say, oh yeah, it's too fast. Slow it down a little bit. So we have those micro decisions, but then the macro decisions about the the shape of an entire scene or an act um, really becomes something where you I I just have the score spread out on my desk. I actually usually take um, a number of sheets of paper, um, tape them together, and kind of map out where where things are so that I can keep reminding myself, okay, this scene is in this atmosphere with this kind of tempo, these characters, and just really trying to get the whole the whole of it uh, in my uh, in my thinking. But yes, it, it it's months of preparation, months of of imagining how things might be. And then as with all opera, you have when you get together with the artists, you have to be able to be flexible enough to think, oh, I had even after months, I hadn't quite thought of it that way. And that is actually the better solution and yield to it or say, actually, you didn't quite learn that the right way. The composer wants this and insist on it. So it just depends on the situation. It uh, you know, I, one of my first operas was um, Nixon in China. And it yeah. was really hard because that's not the opera you should take as an introduction to going to the concert hall. Um, it, it, clearly an American opera. <clears throat> um, how, and, I, and I'll go with you on this, I, I, I want to hear. Uh, it, it's been really hard uh, for American conductors and composers to make a name for themselves. Obviously, like obviously there's uh, Lenny, uh, Lenny and, and there's Philip Glass and um, one or two here and there, but in general, Americans have not been very successful in having like, uh, like Italy that has you know, 15 conductors that you can name right away. 
Why is that? Because the U.S. has fantastic talent and fantastic uh, schools, fantastic people, um, in spite of everything. And, and, and but but getting to be an American conductor has been really hard, and it's something that you've been very successful at. So I want to know, in your opinion, why is that? Um, well, I think Michael, Mike, I think Michael we, Tilson Thomas. I was forgetting about him. It, it, of course, yeah. Guy. I mean, I think I think there's a number of things. I think Americans are very hard on each other when it comes to. Um, observing how how we perform i think we are we are hard on each other um which i think is we we should give each other a little bit more room to grow and not just say oh i've seen this person at age 34 now they're 54 uh, i remember when they were 34 and i didn't like them so therefore there's no they don't allow for sometimes we don't allow for that growth to happen so i'm trying to remember that when i think about what what we're doing um i think there is a um there is a there's another group of people that that make these decisions. You know, the artist managers, um, etc. That are that are very very um, powerful when it comes to deciding who moves up and who doesn't move up, and why one one person or one area of the field does does not move up is. Is tricky. I mean, there. I, I will say that there is a. There remains a um, criticism of conductors who are willing to be uh, less maestro <laughs> with the public. Uh, there, if you if you are a conductor who is who really wants to address the audience and do something other than the the menu concert approach you are less serious, taken less seriously, um, which I think is strange because we're just trying to develop the audience. So I think there's a number of factors. We'll see what happens post COVID, um, whether the people that have endured and developed these different skills are found to be more useful and more effective. Um, but, but as an industry, we're also very, very quick to pigeonhole people so there are opera composers, there are opera conductors, there are chamber musicians, there are crossover artists. And the scary part about being in the business now globally is when you find yourself in a pigeonhole, it is very hard to convince somebody to say, yes, well, um, yes, I did that, uh, that album of covers for, you know, whatever, um, and I've, I've been playing Mozart violin concerto number four forever. And I really want to play that. And somehow the industry can be very reluctant to say, oh yeah, of course your, your artistry is amazing. We'll, we'll take that chance. So I think it's not just an American thing, but I, I, I think American, we, you know, I think people have to understand that the, the pressure for payroll, uh, for, for keeping the lights on in, a, in spe uh, specifically in the United States is so overwhelming because we don't have government support. We don't have the cushion that allows us to take some of the chances, so to speak, to give people some runway to grow. You're either useful for us or we have to move on. And I think, I think we have, we have gotten to a point in certain areas where we, we just have somebody there, we chew them up and we say, all right, you're useful. We'll bring you back. You didn't accomplish X, Y, or Z. You're out and forever out. Um, it's just a. Uh, it's tricky. It's really tricky. I, I failed I, to mention I, uh, Marin Elsop, who is more appreciated outside of the United States than in the U.S. And she is like, you know, I love classical music because uh, she conducted uh, Beethoven Ninth, and I, I happened to be in Sao Paulo in the concert hall and. Uh, that was it. That's all it took for me to, you know, want to, to be more involved in classical music. Like she's great. She plays all over Europe, Sao Paulo, obviously. But you know, in, in the U.S., I think my my impression is that she gets, uh, uh, you know, she's less impressive in the for a U.S. market, and I don't know why that is. 
Yeah, I, I, she's amazing. Michael Tilson Thomas. I mean, all the people that you mentioned are are remarkable Americans. Um, there is, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we've, as a, as a country, as a classical music entity, the United States has fully agreed what the role of a music director slash or, or a guest conductor really is. And so I think that tension is really, um, is really tricky. There, there's often discussion about the first 10 minutes that a conductor's with an orchestra, that the, the orchestra decides in the first 10 minutes or less whether that conductor is worthy, worth, or whether it's going to be worth the investment of the orchestra that week to put that program together. Of course, they'll do it, but you know, is that someone that's interesting? Um, and we're all so different about in, in terms of how our process works. Um, and I think that sometimes we can just look at somebody and say, I don't like how they give that upbeat. Therefore, I'm not interested at all. Um, I, uh, you know, sometimes I'll watch a colleague, um, working with a soloist for the first time, and maybe they didn't catch some little thing in the accompaniment and you can just feel the orchestra groan. Oh, they did. They didn't get that. So they're not good. And off they go. I, I don't know. It's, 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 um, it's a very, being a conductor is a very isolating experience to start with. Um, and I think, uh, you, I think you just have to be very committed to what your, your mission is and your vision for what you want to accomplish. And then the chips fall as they, as they do. Um, my, my chips have fallen in, in wonderful ways, which I'm, I'm extremely grateful for. Um, and now I'm with an organization that, that is really, really focused on developing its audience, competing in a very, very, um, dense market, Los Angeles area, um, where people are being very creative and I'm very inspired by what I have to do to, to, to break through. Um, but I know that that might not be the, the mix that somebody in another part of the country wants. And I think you just have to enjoy the, the, the incredible gift that we as performers have, which is to, to share that with the audience. So, yeah, but the industry is always evolving and there'll certainly be a post COVID time and it'll be very yeah, interesting fine. to see what happens. Yeah. Um, what, um, uh, two more questions. One, I read somewhere that you're a pilot as well. <laughs> Uh, why, why does a conductor want to fly his own plane? Yeah, well, I, I, I had a small little single prop plane for many, many years, which I sold a couple of years ago. Um, I, I was, oh, I actually lived near a small municipal airport in Buffalo, New York, and I had these tiny airplanes buzzing my house all the time. So I was just fascinated by, by them and took lessons once I got out of college and just, thought it was an amazing thing. And, and, you know, 3000 flying hours later, um, I, I decided to stop. I actually, you know, the whole, the climate change and everything that's involved with what's going on in the world has, has always struck me. And I, I remember a couple of times I turned that key to turn the engine on and I thought, it's a lot of very heavy fuel, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, <laughs> and it's not a precisely on leaded. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I've I've put my I've put my wings down for a while, and we'll see. And there's great technology coming with hybrids and stuff. So, but it was well, I, it has been great. I, I learned flying a 172, a Cessna 172. It was a great experience. Absolutely, and not not yeah. even close to. Uh, to 4,000 hours, but uh, you could be flying regional aircraft for, <laughs> for, with the amount of hours. I, you know, it's funny. I have, I have kept an eye on that because, you know, not knowing what this industry will look like in the future, <laughs> I, 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 I do qualify. <laughs> a, I could, I could take that path. <laughs> exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be flying right now and I will be playing for some Mozart for you at the same time. I, exactly. While we're taxing, <laughs> enjoy, enjoy the, James Ennis playing the concerto. <laughs> exactly. It's fantastic. Uh, Michael, what's, uh, what's next for Michael Christie? Uh, what's, uh, what's in the horizon? Um, obviously, uh, New West, but what else uh, should we expect uh, from you? Well, I am very 
I'm very focused on maintaining a foot in the opera world as well as the symphony worlds. I am, I've, I've been very diligent about avoiding that pigeonhole as we discussed before. So, um, there's plenty of opera that's on the schedule when those performances are, are reprogrammed. Um, yeah. And I, I'm just really excited about seeing how the, uh, adapting technology and understanding what this this whole new world will look like means for doing the things that that i think are important so i i plan to be more online i plan to um learn more about that technology and just keep hoping to help our industry especially in the united states because classical music needs needs lovers in it you know people really love to 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 be to be um, sharing that message because there's a lot of great, great things happening out there. I, I think that the love for classical music is definitely there. It, uh, Gustavo Dudamel at some point said it's, it's our fault for not bringing it to the people or not making people understand what we're trying to do. Famous, fam famous quote from Dudamel. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for joining me today it's a pleasure it's been a pleasure working with you in the, in the last few concerts and certainly to talk to you it's uh, you're a wealth of uh, fantastic information and knowledge thank you thank you it's my pleasure for this week i think it's on the 10th my pick of the week you mentioned james ennis he will be playing li on a live stream with stuart goodyear live from uh, kerner hall so join them Tickets are not expensive, and uh, I will try to get uh, James to join us in a conversation. We already had Stuart Goodyear, who's fantastic. He has recorded the sonatas, uh, all of them, in one go, and play them actually on a sonataton, as he likes to call it. Um, we will be hopefully again uh, back here on the cafe next week. Um, we have uh, a couple of confirmations coming, so just stay tuned. And again, Michael. Thank you very much. Until next time. It's a pleasure. Have a great morning.